Hello, my name is Stephen Baskerville, Professor of Government at Patrick Henry College. Jordan Peterson is obviously a figure of enormous talent and influence, and there is certainly much to admire in what he says. But lately, he seems to have joined today's conservative political game of talking out of both sides of his mouth, at least when it comes to sexual issues. As with others before him, I don't think he realizes how debilitating and self-debasing is this behavior. He has used his new celebrity status to embark on the popular game of attacking people who have no platform to defend themselves. This is the method not of a serious intellectual, but of a demagogue and bully. Though it must be said that he is in eminent company, including in this instance, presidents of the United States. The ad hominem method is cheap and easy. First, you represent someone else's views in your words rather than their own, and then you attack the straw man you have, criti you have created. Peterson, Peterson does not criticize by name, in which case the individuals criticized might demand to reply. No, he must attack a group whose members are rendered by association guilty of whatever psychological disorder he chooses to attribute to them. Dr. Peterson amus amusingly ridicules the excesses of feminism on the left, but his critique is followed by no constructive solution. For better or worse, some very specific solutions are offered by some citizens groups, including those who style themselves men going their own way, or MGTOW. These are mostly parents who campaign against the injustices of divorce courts. Of course, we are all free to disagree with their solutions or anyone else's. I often do myself. But that requires that we engage their arguments and debate them. As an academic, this is supposed to be Dr. Peterson's profession and claim to authority. But Dr. Peterson does not engage with those with whom he disagrees. He says they are interesting to study as if they are laboratory animals, unable to express serious convictions in their own words. Indeed, he calls them weasels. He appears to adopt this condescending behavior in a classroom lecture to students. I don't know what standards are acceptable at the University of Toronto, but at my institution, name calling is not considered a very elevated method of academic pedagogy. One may lapse into it from time to time, but expressing pride in the practice by disseminating it in a public video uh, seems especially peculiar from one who adopts the posture of public gadfly, exposing the degeneration of others' academic standards. Dr. Peterson must paraphrase the words of his targets because though he himself is an academic scholar, he is not bothered to consult the literature on the topic, as scholars are normally expected to do, certainly before inflicting their uninformed opinions on a captive audience of students. But media academics often opine off the cuff. Perhaps this failure might be excused by one of the most striking features of those who criticize family courts. It is difficult to know what constitutes their legitimate voice because it is almost impossible for them to get their views published in respectable media outlets. Indeed, the only way to know from the mainstream media that there even is a family court reform movement is to read the attacks on it. Government bankrolled scholars, with even fewer scruples than Dr. Peterson, are free to publish unanswered attacks on legally innocent people in respectable publications including ostensibly dispassionate academic publications, using taxpayers' money, knowing full well that their words will never be subject to any meaningful peer review and certainly never challenged by those they are attacking, because the objects of their attack are never, and I mean never, permitted any voice in the media or academic world. To my knowledge, this status is unique. I can state this so categorically because I'm one of the few academically employed scholars who manages to write about the issues Dr. Peterson raises without being fired. Though in fact, I was fired from one government funded university when I began writing about these issues. Paul Nathanson of McGill University is the only other one I know. So there are at least two scholars whose peer reviewed research Dr. Peterson has not bothered to consult before launching his tirade. And we have a stake in challenging Dr. Peterson's own contribution to the erosion of academic standards and his willingness to substitute political opinion in place of disinterested scholarship and research. Dr. Peterson did apologize for his remarks, though for many the apology was almost as insulting as the original attack. Invoking psychotherapy to dismiss as a psychological disorder the moral or religious or political convictions of those who believe that they have been the victims of injustice, correctly by Dr. Peterson's own assessment, is a nasty little game with a very ugly pedigree. It may also be professionally unethical. But something deeper and more troubling emerges from this ethical lapse a failure to question why it happened. In his apology, Dr. Peterson confesses that his adversaries, quote, have a point. Though again, we hear that point only in his words, not theirs. Dr. Peterson's professional practice has made him aware, in his words, 
that the court systems are staggeringly anti-male, absurdly, horribly anti-male, and that decent, hardworking, family-oriented people are demolished by the court systems, end quote. In other words, he has long known full well that what he calls brutal and awful injustices occur in American and Canadian courts. These include, and these words are mine, incarcerations without trial, summary confiscations of children and property from legally unimpeachable citizens, beatings, and disappearances. And yet not only has he remained silent about this, he seems to make a lucrative living from its victims. And I don't flinch from using that word. I don't know if Dr. Peterson practices forensic psychotherapy, that is therapy ordered and paid or ordered to be paid by state officials, but I've documented fully my charges that this is a thoroughly crooked practice saturated with conflicts of interest and corruption. In other words, Dr. Peterson's colleagues are part of a money-making machine that inflicts what he acknowledges to be horrific injustices. Not being conversant in psychotherapeutic lingo myself, I will not venture to speculate if the unpleasant tone of Dr. Peterson's attack is explained by Tacitus' observation that it is human nature to hate those whom you have wronged. I would have thought Dr. Peterson would have felt obligated, having discovered this abuse of government power, including by members of his own profession, to marshal his learning, eloquence, and public platform to call attention to the injustices he has discovered, being practiced by state officials in the name of public justice and using taxpayers' money. But apparently it is easier to jump on the bandwagon and kick those who are down and cannot respond. A perfunctory apology, replete with further attacks upon those to whom one is ostensibly apologizing, would seem to bring the, to bring the matter to, if you will forgive the jargon taken from Dr. Peterson's trade, closure. Perhaps my point is simply what we used to say to bullies, go pick on someone your own size. If Dr. Peterson wants to pick a fight over injustices in family courts, he should act like a man and take on someone by name whose views are stated for the record and who has the time and resources to research the matter properly and whose professional credentials are invested in what they state to be the truth. I hereby volunteer for the role. If he wants to debate these issues, I am available. And if he does not, well, we had a word for that too. One often observed to be the corollary of a bully. Dr. Peterson's own choice of words might be the most appropriate for one who adopts weasel words. If Dr. Peterson wants to be taken seriously as a scholar and an intellectual, he must act like a scholar and a man. He will issue a proper apology and then he will demonstrate its sincerity by directing his learning, resources, and platform to understanding and exposing the most repressive government machinery ever created in the English-speaking democracies. My name is Stephen Baskerville, and you will find these points documented in my two most recent books, Taken into Custody and The New Politics of Sex.